Chapter 6.4 Parties in Philosophy and Philosophical Blockheads It remains for us to examine the relation between machism and religion. But this broadens into the question of whether there are parties generally in philosophy, and what is meant by nonpartisanship in philosophy. Throughout the preceding exposition, in connection with every problem of epistemology touched upon and in connection with every philosophical question raised by the new physics, we trace the struggle between materialism and idealism. Behind the mass of new terminological devices, behind the litter of erudite scholasticism, we invariably discern two principal alignments, two fundamental trends in the solution of philosophical problems. Whether nature, matter, the physical, the external world should be taken as primary, and consciousness, mind, sensation, experience as the widespread terminology of our time has it, the psychical, etc., should be regarded as secondary that is the root question which in fact continues to divide the philosophers into two great camps. The source of thousands upon thousands of errors and of the confusion reigning in this sphere is the fact that beneath the envelope of terms, definitions, scholastic devices and verbal addresses, these two fundamental trends are overlooked. Bogdanov, for instance, refuses to acknowledge his idealism, because, you see, instead of the metaphysical concepts nature and mind, comma, he has taken the experiential, physical and psychical. A word has been changed. The genius of Marx and Engels consisted in the very fact that in the course of a long period, nearly half a century, they developed materialism, that they further advanced one fundamental trend in philosophy, that they did not stop at reiterating epistemological problems that had already been solved, but consistently applied and showed how to apply this same materialism in the sphere of the social sciences, mercilessly brushing aside as litter and rubbish the pretentious rigmarole, the innumerable attempts to discover a new line in philosophy to invent a new trend and so forth. The verbal nature of such attempts, the scholastic play with new philosophicalisms comma the clogging of the issue by pretentious devices, the inability to comprehend and clearly present the struggle between the two fundamental epistemological trends this is what Marx and Engels persistently pursued and fought against throughout their entire activity. We said, nearly half a century dot and, indeed, as far back as 1843, when Marx was only becoming Marx, that is, the founder of scientific socialism, the founder of modern materialism, which is immeasurably richer in content and incomparably more consistent than all preceding forms of materialism, even at that time Marx pointed out with amazing clarity the basic trends in philosophy. Karl Grund quotes a letter from Marx to Feuerbach dated October 20, 1843, 8, in which Marx invites Feuerbach to write an article for the Deutsch Französisch Gerbücher 9, against Schelling. This Schelling, writes Marx, is a shallow braggart with his claims to having embraced and transcended all previous philosophical trends. To the French Romanticists and Mystics he, Schelling, says, I am the union of philosophy and theology, to the French materialists, I am the union of the flesh and the idea, to the French skeptics, I am the destroyer of dogmatism. One, that the skeptics, comma, be they called Humans or Kantians, or, in the 20th century, Miggins, cry out against the dogmatism of both materialism and idealism, Marx at that time already realized, and, without letting himself be diverted by any one of a thousand wretched little philosophical systems, he was able through Feuerbach to take the direct materialist road as against idealism. Thirty years later, in the afterword to the second edition of the first volume of Capital, Marx just as clearly and definitely contrasted his materialism to Hegel as idealism, the most consistent and developed idealism of all. He contemptuously brushed Comtean positivism aside and dubbed as wretched Epigoni the contemporary philosophers who imagined that they had destroyed Hegel when in reality they had reverted to a repetition of the pre-Hegelian errors of Kant and Hume. 10. 
In the letter to Q. Gilman of June 27, 1870, Marx refers just as contemptuously to Buckner, Lang, Dewaring, Fuckner, etc. Comma because they understood nothing of Hegel as dialectics and treated him with scorn. 2. And finally, take the various philosophical utterances by Marx in Capital and other works, and you will find an invariable basic motif, viz., insistence upon materialism and contemptuous derision of all obscurity, of all confusion and all deviations towards idealism. All Marx's philosophical utterances revolve within these two fundamental opposites, and, in the eyes of professorial philosophy, their defect lies in this narrowness and one-sidedness. As a matter of fact, this refusal to recognize the hybrid projects for reconciling materialism and idealism constitutes the great merit of Marx, who moved forward along a sharply deemed philosophical road. Entirely in the spirit of Marx, and in close collaboration with him, Engels in all his philosophical works briefly and clearly contrasts the materialist and idealist lines in regard to all questions, without, either in 1878, or 1888, or 1892, 11, taking seriously the endless attempts to transcend one-sidedness of materialism and idealism, to proclaim a new trend positivism, realism, or some other professorial charlatanism. Engels based his whole fight against Dewaring on the demand for consistent adherence to materialism, accusing the materialist Dewaring of verbally confusing the issue, of phrase mongering, of methods of reasoning which involved a compromise with idealism and adoption of the position of idealism. Either materialism consistent to the end, or the falsehood and confusion of philosophical idealism such is the formulation of the question given in every paragraph of anti dewaring and only people whose minds had already been corrupted by reactionary professorial philosophy could fail to notice it. And right down to 1894, when the last preface was written to anti dewaring revised and enlarged by the author for the last time, Engels continued to follow the latest developments both in philosophy and science, and continued with all his former resoluteness to hold to his lucid and firm position, brushing away the litter of new systems, big and little. That Engels followed the new developments in philosophy is evident from Ludwig Feuerbach. In the 1888 preface, mention is even made of such a phenomenon as the rebirth of classical German philosophy in England and Scandinavia, whereas Engels, both in the preface and in the text of the book, has nothing but the most extreme contempt for the prevailing Neo-Kantianism and Humism. It is quite obvious that Engels, observing the repetition by fashionable German and English philosophy of the old pre-Hegelian errors of Kantianism and Humism, was prepared to expect some good even from the turn to Hegel, in England and Scandinavia, hoping that the great idealist and dialectician would help to disclose petty idealist and metaphysical errors. 12. Without undertaking an examination of the vast number of shades of neo kantianism in Germany and of humism in England, Engels from the very outset refutes their fundamental deviation from materialism. Engels declares that the entire tendency of these two schools is scientifically a step backward. And what is his opinion of the undoubtedly positivist, comma, according to the current terminology, the undoubtedly realist tendencies of these neo Kantians and Humeans, among whose number, for instance, he could not help knowing Huxley? That positivism and that realism which attracted, and which continued to attract, an infinite number of muddleheads. Engels declared to be a B.S. Tophilistine method of smuggling in materialism while abusing and abjuring it publicly. One has to reflect only very little on such an appraisal of Thomas Huxley a very great scientist and an incomparably more realistic realist and positive positivist than Mach, Avenarius, and Co. In order to understand how contemptuously Engels would have greeted the present infatuation of a group of Marxists with recent positivism, the latest realism, etc. Marx and Engels were partisans in philosophy from start to finish, 
they were able to detect the deviations from materialism and concessions to idealism and fideism in each and every new tendency. They therefore appraised Huxley exclusively from the standpoint of his materialist consistency. They therefore rebuked Feuerbach for not pursuing materialism to the end, for renouncing materialism because of the errors of individual materialists, for combating religion in order to renovate it or invent a new religion, for being unable, in sociology, to rid himself of idealist phraseology and become a materialist. And whatever particular mistakes he committed in his exposition of dialectical materialism, J. Dietzgen fully appreciated and took over this great and most precious tradition of his teachers. Dietzgen sinned much by his clumsy deviations from materialism, but he never attempted to dissociate himself from it in principle, he never attempted to hoist a new standard and always at the decisive moment he firmly and categorically declared, I am a materialist, our philosophy is a materialist philosophy. Of all parties, R. Joseph Dietzgen justly said, the middle party is the most repulsive. Just as parties in politics are more and more becoming divided into two camps, so science too is being divided into two general classes, generalists and metaphysicians on the one hand, and physicists, or materialists, on the other. 3. The intermediate elements and conciliatory quacks with their various appellations spiritualists, sensationalists, realists, etc., etc. fall into the current on their way. We aim at definiteness and clarity. The reactionaries who sound a retreat, retreat blazer, call themselves idealists, for, and materialist should be the name for all who are striving to liberate the human mind from the metaphysical spell. If we compare the two parties respectively to solid and liquid, between them there is a mush.5. True, the realists, comma, etc., including the positivists, comma, the McGins, etc., are all a wretched mush, they are a contemptible middle party in philosophy, who confuse the materialist and idealist trends on every question. The attempt to escape these two basic trends in philosophy is nothing but conciliatory quackery. J. Dietzgen had not the slightest doubt that the scientific priestcraft of idealist philosophy is simply the antechamber to open priestcraft. Scientific priestcraft, comma, he wrote, is seriously endeavoring to assist religious priestcraft. Up. Sit. P. 51. In particular, the sphere of epistemology, the misunderstanding of the human mind, is such a louse hole, laws group, in which both kinds of priests lay their eggs. Graduated flunkies, comma, who with their talk of ideal blessings stultify the people by their tortuous, just robbed, idealism, p. 53. That is J. Dietzgen's opinion of the professors of philosophy. Just as the antipodes of the good God is the devil. So the professorial priest, Kadir Pfeffin, has his opposite pole in the materialist. The materialist theory of knowledge is a universal weapon against religious belief, p. 55, and not only against the notorious, formal and common religion of the priests, but also against the most refined, elevated professorial religion of muddled, Ben Belter, idealists, p. 58. Dietzgen was ready to prefer religious honesty to the half-heartedness of free-thinking professors, p. 60, for there at least there is a system comma there we find integral people, people who do not separate theory from practice. For the hair professor's philosophy is not a science, but a means of defense against social democracy. p. 107. All who call themselves philosophers, professors, and university lecturers are, despite their apparent free thinking, more or less immersed in superstition and mysticism. And in relation to social democracy constitute a single reactionary mass, p. 108. Now, in order to follow the true path, without being led astray by all the religious and philosophical gibberish, Welsh, it is necessary to study the falsest of all false paths, Der Holzweg Der Holzweg, Philosophy, p. 
103. Let us now examine Mach, Avenarius and their school from the standpoint of parties and philosophy. Oh, these gentlemen boast of their non-partisanship, and if they have an antipodes, it is the materialist. And only the materialist. A red thread that runs through all the writings of all the McGins is the stupid claim to have risen above materialism and idealism, to have transcended this obsolete antithesis, but in fact the whole fraternity are continually sliding into idealism and are conducting a steady and incessant struggle against materialism. The subtle epistemological crotchets of a man like Avenarius are but professorial inventions an attempt to form a small philosophical sect of his own, but, as a matter of fact, in the general circumstances of the struggle of ideas and trends in modern society, the objective part played by these epistemological artifices is in every case the same, namely, to clear the way for idealism and fideism, and to serve them faithfully. In fact, it cannot be an accident that the small school of imperial criticists is acclaimed by the English spiritualists, like Ward, by the French neocriticists, who praise Mach for his attack on materialism, and by the German immanentists. Dietz Gen S. Expression, graduated flunkies of Fideism, hits the nail on the head in the case of Mach, Avenarius, and their whole school. 6 6. Here is another example of how the widespread currents of reactionary bourgeois philosophy make use of machism in practice. Perhaps the latest fashion in the latest American philosophy is pragmatism 15, from the Greek word pramaction, that is, a philosophy of action. The philosophical journals perhaps speak more of pragmatism than of anything else. Pragmatism ridicules the metaphysics both of idealism and materialism acclaims expertness and only experience, recognizes practice as the only criterion, refers to the positivist movement in general, especially turns for support to Oswald, Mach, Pearson, Poincaré and Duhem for the belief that sickness is not an absolute copy of reality and successfully deduces from all this a god for practical purposes, and only for practical purposes, without any metaphysics and without transcending the bounds of experience, C.F. William James, Pragmatism. A new name for some old ways of thinking, New York, and London, 1907, pages 57 and 106 especially. From the standpoint of materialism the difference between machism and pragmatism is as insignificant and unimportant as the difference between imperial criticism and imperial monism. Compare. For example, Bogdan of S. definition of truth with the pragmatist definition of truth, which is, truth for a pragmatist becomes a class name for all sorts of definite working values in experience, Ibid, p. 68. Lenin. It is the misfortune of the Russian Mukins, who undertook to reconcile Machism and Marxism, that they trusted the reactionary professors of philosophy and as a result slipped down an inclined plane. The methods of operation employed in the various attempts to develop and supplement Marx were not very ingenious. They read Ostwald, believe Ostwald, paraphrase Ostwald and call it Marxism. They read Mach, believe Mach, paraphrase Mach and call it Marxism. They read Poincaré, believe Poincaré, paraphrase Poincaré and call it Marxism. Not a single one of these professors, who are capable of making very valuable contributions in the special fields of chemistry, history, or physics, can be trusted one iota when it comes to philosophy. Why? For the same reason that not a single professor of political economy, who may be capable of very valuable contributions in the field of factual and specialized investigations, can be trusted one iota when it comes to the general theory of political economy. For in modern society the latter is as much a partisan science as is epistemology. Taken as a whole, the professors of economics are nothing but learned salesmen of the capitalist class, while the professors of philosophy are learned salesmen of the theologians. The task of Marxists in both cases is to be able to master and adapt the achievements of these salesmen, for instance, 
you will not make the slightest progress in the investigation of new economic phenomena unless you have recourse to the works of these salesmen, and to be able to lop off their reactionary tendency, to pursue your own line and to combat the whole alignment of forces and classes hostile to us. And this is just what our Americans were unable to do, they slavishly follow the lead of the reactionary professorial philosophy. Perhaps we have gone astray, but we are seeking, comma, wrote Lunakarsky in the name of the authors of the studies. The trouble is that it is not you who are seeking, but you who are being sought. You do not go with your, that is, Marxist, for you want to be Marxists, standpoint to every change in the bourgeois philosophical fashion, the fashion comes to you, foists upon you its new surrogates got up in the idealist taste. One day all in us world, the next day all la mock, and the day after all la poincare. These silly theoretical devices, energetics, comma, elements, comma, interjections, comma, etc., in which you so naively believe are confined to a narrow and tiny school, while the ideological and social tendency of these devices is immediately spotted by the wards, the neocriticists, the eminentists, the low patents, and the pragmatists and it serves their purposes. The infatuation for imperial criticism and physical idealism passes as rapidly as the infatuation for neo-Kantianism and physiological idealism, but Fideism takes its toll from every such infatuation and Modi has its devices in a thousand ways for the benefit of philosophical idealism. The attitude towards religion and the attitude towards national science excellently illustrate the actual class use made of imperial criticism by bourgeois reactionaries. Take the first question. Do you think it is an accident that in a collective work directed against the philosophy of Marxism Lunakarsky went so far as to speak of the deification of the higher human potentialities, comma, of religious atheism, comma, etc. 7. If you do, it is only because the Russian Mikans have not informed the public correctly regarding the whole Mikan current in Europe and the attitude of this current to religion. Not only is this attitude in no way similar to the attitude of Marx, Engels, J. Dietzgen and even Feuerbach, but it is the very opposite, beginning with Pezoltes' statement to the effect that imperial criticism contradicts neither theism nor atheism. Ein Führung in die Philosophie der Reinen Verfahrung, B.D. I. S. 351, or Marques declaration that religious opinion is a private affair, French Trans, p. 434, and ending with the explicit Fideism, the explicitly arch reactionary views of Cornelius, who praises Mach and whom Mach praises, of course and of all the eminentists. The neutrality of a philosopher in this question is in itself servility to Fideism, and Mach and Avenarius, because of the very premises of their epistemology, do not and cannot rise above neutrality. Once you deny objective reality, given us in sensation, you have already lost every one of your weapons against Fideism, for you have slipped into agnosticism or subjectivism and that is all Fideism wants. If the perceptual world is objective reality, then the door is closed to every other reality or quasi-reality, remember that Bazarov believed the realism of the eminentists, who declare God to be a real concept. If the world is matter in motion, matter can and must be infinitely studied in the infinitely complex and detailed manifestations and ramifications of this motion, the motion of this matter, but beyond it beyond the physical comma external world, with which everyone is familiar, there can be nothing. And the hostility to materialism and the showers of abuse heaped on the materialists are all in the order of things in civilized and democratic Europe. All this is going on to this day. All this is being concealed from the public by the Russian Mekans, who have not once attempted even simply to compare the attacks made on materialism by Mach, Avenarius, Bezold, and co., with the statements made in favor of materialism by Feuerbach, Marx, Engels and J. A. Dietzgen. But this concealment of the attitude of Mach and Avenarius to Fideism will not avail. The facts speak for themselves. 
no efforts can release these reactionary professors from the pillory in which they have been placed by the kisses of Ward, the neocriticists, Shupp, Schubert Sautern, Leckler, the pragmatists, etc. and the influence of the persons mentioned, as philosophers and professors, the popularity of their ideas among the educated comma that is, the bourgeois, public and the specific literature they have created are ten times wider and richer than the particular little school of Mach and Avenarius. The little school serves those it should serve, and it is exploited as it deserves to be exploited. The shameful things to which Lunakarsky has stooped are not exceptional, they are the product of imperial criticism, both Russian and German. They cannot be defended on the grounds of the good intentions of the author or the special meaning of his words, if it were the direct and common, that is, the directly phytistic meaning, we should not stop to discuss matters with the author, for most likely not a single Marxist could be found in whose eyes such statements would not have placed Anatole Lunakarsky exactly in the same category as Peter Struve. If this is not the case, and it is not the case yet, it is exclusively because we perceive the special meaning in our fighting while there is still ground for a fight on comradely lines. This is just the disgrace of Lunakarsky's statements that he could connect them with his good intentions. This is just the evil of his theory that it permits the use of such methods or of such conclusions in the pursuit of good intentions. This is just the trouble that at best good intentions are the subjective affair of Tom. Dick or Harry, while the social significance of such statements is undeniable and indisputable, and no reservation or explanation can mitigate it. One must be blind not to see the ideological affinity by Iwin Lunakarsky's deification of the higher human potentialities and Bogdanov's general substitution of the psychical for all physical nature. This is one and the same thought. In the one case it is expressed principally from the aesthetic standpoint, and in the other from the epistemological standpoint. Substitution comma approaching the subject tacitly and from a different angle, already deifies the higher human potentialities comma by divorcing the psychical from man and by substituting an immensely extended, abstract, divinely lifeless psychical in general for all physical nature. And what of Yashkivik's logos introduced into the irrational stream of experience? A single claw ensnared, and the bird is lost. And our Armakins have all become ensnared in idealism, that is, in a diluted and subtle fideism, they became ensnared from the moment they took sensation not as an image of the external world but as a special element. It is nobody's sensation, nobody's mind, nobody's spirit. Nobody's will this is what one inevitably comes to if one does not recognize the materialist theory that the human mind reflects an objectively real external world. Notes 1. Karl Grun, Ludwig Feuerbach in Sanum Brief which so on na class, so e in Saner Philosophis in Schlichter at I, B.D., Leipzig 1874, S. 361. Lenin. 2. Of the positivist Beasley, Marx, in the letter of December 13, 1870, speaks as follows Professor Beasley is a comtist and as such obliged to think up all sorts of crotchets. 13. Compare this with the opinion given of the positivists of the Huxley type by Engels in 1892. 14. Lenin. 3. Here again we have a clumsy and inexact expression. Instead of metaphysicians, comma, he should have said idealists. Elsewhere, Dietzton himself contrasts the metaphysicians and the dialecticians. Lenin. 4. Note that Dietzton has corrected himself and now explains more exactly which is the party of the enemies of materialism. Lenin. 5. See the article, Social Democratic Philosophy, comma, written in 1876, Kulnir Philosophus Schriffen. 1903, S. 135, Lenin. 6. This footnote has been moved into body of document. 7. Studies, pages 157, 159. 
In the Zagranic Nyagazeta 16, the same author speaks of scientific socialism and its religious significance, number 3, p. 5, and in Abrazivanii, 17, 1908, number 1, p. 164, he explicitly says, for a long time a new religion has been maturing within me. Lenin. 8. See Early Writings of K. Marx and F. Engels, 1956, Russian edition, pages 257 to 58. 9. Deutsch Franz Osis Gerbucher, German French. Yearbooks and Annual published in Paris in German, edited by Karl Marx and Arnold Rouge. Only the first, double number was issued in February Rary 1844. It contained Marx's works The Jewish Question and Contribution to the Critique of Hegel as Philosophy of Bite. Introduction, as well as Engels outlines of a criticism of political economy and the position of England. Thomas Carlyle. Past and Present Backslash Then Space. These works mark the definitive adoption of the standpoint of materialism and communism by Marx and Engels. Marx's disagreement in principle with the bourgeois radical Rouge was the main reason why the journal ceased to appear. 10. C.K. Marx, Capital, Volume 1, Moscow, 1959, p. 19. 13. C.K. Marx and F. Engels, Selected Correspondence, Moscow. 1955, pages 290, 306. 14. C.F. Engels' special introduction to the English edition of 1892 of his Socialism, Utopian and Scientific, K. Marx and F. Engels, Selected Works, Volume 2, Moscow, 1958, pages 99 to 102. 11. Lenin is referring to Engels' works anti during 1878, Ludwig Feuerbach and the End of Classical German Philosophy. 1888, Special Introduction to the English Edition of 1892 of Socialism, Utopian and Scientific, C. F. Engels, Anti During and K. Marx and F. Engels, Selected Works, Volume 2, Moscow, 1958, pages 358 to 402, 93 115. 12. C. K. Marx and F. Bagels, Selected Works, Volume 2, Moscow, 1958, p. 359. The turn to Hegel in the second half of the 19th century was characteristic of the development of bourgeois philosophy in a number of European countries and the USA and Britain. It began with the appearance in 1865 of James Hutch's and Sterling's book The Secret of Hegel. The bourgeois ideologists were attracted by Hegel as absolute idealism, which offered wide opportunities for a theoretical justification of religion. There developed a special philosophical trend which was given the name of Anglo-Hegelianism, whose representatives, Thomas Green, the brothers Edward and John Cayard, Francis Bradley and others, vigorously attacked materialism making use of the reactionary aspects of Hegel as doctrine. In the Scandinavian countries, too, Hegelian philosophy became more influential in the second half of the 18th century. In Sweden its revival was sponsored by Johan Borrelius who counterpissed Hegelianism to the prevailing subjective idealist philosophy. In Norway the right-wing Hegelians Marcus Jacob Munrad, G. W. Ling and others interpreted Hegel as philosophy in the spirit of mysticism, discarding its rationalism and trying to subordinate science to religion. In Denmark, where Hegelian philosophy began to spread even during Hegel's lifetime, it was criticized from the same standpoint. The spread of Hegel's philosophy did not lead to its revival, the bourgeois at bygones of Hegel developed mainly in the spirit of subjective idealism, various aspects of his conservative philosophical system. All this paved the way for the emergence at the turn of the century of Neo-Hegelian a reactionary trend of bourgeois philosophical thought in the imperialist era that attempted to adapt Hegel's philosophy to fascist ideology.
15. Pragmatism A subjective idealist trend of bourgeois, mainly American, philosophy and the imperialist era. It arose in the seven ties of the last century in the USA as a reflection of specific features of the development of American capitalism, replacing the hitherto prevailing religious philosophy. The main propositions of pragmatism were formulated by Charles Peirce. As an independent philosophical tendency it took shape at the turn of the century in the works of William James and Ferdinand Schiller and was further developed in the instrumentalism of John Dewey. The pragmatists consider that the central problem of philosophy is the attainment of true knowledge. However, they completely distort the very concept of truth, already Pierce looked on cognition as a purely psychological, subjective process of achieving religious belief. James substituted the concept of usefulness, of success or advantage, for the concept of truth, that is, for the objectively true reflection of reality. From his point of view, all concepts, including religious ones, are true insofar as they are useful. Dewey went, even farther by declaring all scientific theories, all moral principles and social institutions, to be merely instruments for the attainment of the personal aims of the individual. As the criterion of the truth, usefulness, of knowledge, the pragmatists take experience understood not as human social practice but as the constant stream of individual experiences, of the subjective phenomena of consciousness, they regard this experience as the solo reality, declaring the concepts of matter and mind obsolete. Like the Machists, the pragmatists claim to have created a third line in philosophy, they try to place themselves above materialism and idealism while in fact advocating one of the varieties of idealism. In contrast to materialist monism, the pragmatists put forward the standpoint of pluralism, according to which there is no internal connection, no conformity to law, in the universe, it is like a mosaic which each person builds in his own way, out of his own individual experiences. Hence, starting out from the needs of the given moment, Pragmatism considers it possible to give different, even contradictory, explanations of one and the same phenomenon. Consistency is declared to be unnecessary, if it is to a man's advantage, he can be a determinist or an indeterminist, he can assert or deny the existence of God, and so on. By basing themselves on the subjective idealist tradition of English philosophy from Berkeley and Hume to John Stuart Mill, by exploiting particular aspects of the theories of Kant, Mach, and Venarius, Nietzsche and Henri Bergson, the American pragmatists created one of the most reactionary philosophical trends of modern times, a convenient form for theoretically defending the interests of the imperialist bourgeoisie. It is for this reason that pragmatism spread so widely in the USA, becoming almost the official American philosophy. There have been advocates of pragmatism at various times in Italy, Germany, France, Czechoslovakia and other countries. 16. Zagranik Gazets, Gazeta Trangia The weekly newspaper of a group of Russian immigrants, published in Geneva from March 16 to April 13, 1908. The four numbers that appeared during this period dealt mainly with the life of Russian immigrants and carried material on events in Russia and abroad. The second number published Lenin's speech Lessons of the Commune at an international meeting in Geneva on March 18, 1908. The newspaper contained propaganda for God-building and machism, articles by A. Bogdanov and A. V. Lunakarsky. Lenin quotes a passage from A. V. Lunakarsky's Sketches of Mode in Russian Literature, which was published in Nos. 2 and 3 of the newspaper. 17. Obrazov I.I., Education A Legal Monthly Literary Magazine of a Popular Scientific and Sociopolitical Character published in St. Petersburg from 1892 to 1909. In 1902 eight printed articles by Social Democrats. In number 2. 1906, 
the magazine printed chapters 5 through 9 of Lenin's work The Agrarian Crisis and the Critics of Marx Backslash Thinspace.